All right. Sorry, I was having a very pleasant conversation with our speaker this morning. I'm Lewis Gilbert. Welcome to uh, this week's installment of the fr our Frontiers um, series. Our speaker today is Nick Jordan, a uh, faculty member in, I'm not sure what department you're in, agronomy, agronomy and plant genetics. The, uh, grand, uh, the, the big question that Nick is going to be talking about is can GMO crops help grow sustainable agriculture? Um, we encourage you to uh, tweet along, and if you are so inclined, please use the hashtag Frontiers. I think those are the, th I don't have my script today, so I'm, I'm pretty sure I've got hit all the main points. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Nick. Uh, we'll have questions at the end. All right, wonderful. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, it's great to see you here on what feels like the first spring day in Minnesota, and I hope you appreciate that I've dressed like a crocus in honor of my wife, Debbie, who's a passionate gardener. So I want to uh, present a perspective um, on some ideas that a bunch of folks and I, and I'll, I'll credit some of the major co-authors of these ideas on my title side here, have been working on for a couple of years. Uh, after a, a, a graduate student-led discussion group sort of unearthed the um, insight that, wow, it's a whole kind of new world out there uh, with, with these new ways of changing the genetic makeup of crops. And so I want to present some perspectives on that and do it as quickly as I can so we'll have a good amount of time to talk it over a little bit. So this being I on E, I think we do a pretty good job of, of lifting up the global importance of agriculture. But for the record, I will say agriculture really matters. And one of the reasons that it really matters is that the basic life support systems of society, food, water, and energy, are all very tightly bound to agriculture. And as we start to understand that um, food security, water security, energy security are things that are both in question and things of, of really vital national and global interest, the importance of agriculture only kind of grows. And so um, I want to underscore that agriculture should not be viewed as a problem, but rather that there is enormous potential in agriculture in literally growing the pie, as it were, of these basic life support systems for society, food, water, and energy. And uh, I, I think, however, there's a vital sort of condition to that that needs to be mentioned, and that is that in order to uh, ach achieve the great potential of agriculture to build the basic life support underpinnings of society, we need to diversify agriculture. In other words, we need to add additional kinds of crops to our current agriculture. And I'll, I'll say I've been working in agricultural science for almost 40 years now, and I will say that, in my opinion, it's, it's very clear that among the ways that we can advance agriculture, diversification is the most high leverage and most promising uh, way to do that. And therefore, the question of diversification is very important. And let me try to uh, provide an example of that. So there are lots and lots of plants, both annual and perennial plants, that we can grow to produce this sort of plant body material that people call biomass. And uh, this is a scenario of um, a typical Midwest landscape that's dominated by annual crops with uh, some kind of transformational change involving diversification with crops that grow this biomass material. I want to point out that there's still plenty of room for these annual crops that we currently grow in this new landscape. But this is a landscape that there's lots of evidence that we can produce more food, more water, and more energy from. And just to sort of give you a sense of what I mean by that, first of all, we're becoming very clever in making all sorts of materials for society out of biomass. Things that can be directly eaten by human beings, various forms of energy, a lot of the sort of building blocks of our material culture, actually, can come from this biomass material. So there are, there are rapidly growing markets for these biomass crops. And these biomass crops have enormous value in terms of the basic sort of resource conservation issues that matter a great deal as we go forward, especially into a future of potential climate change. So the ability of these crops to cover soil, to store carbon in the soil, to retain supplies of water, and that's the sense in which we can increase the amount of water we have, is that we can 
use our agricultural landscapes as sort of giant sponges by cultivating these crops. These are all things that these biomass crops can do. But there is kind of, whoops, there is a problem with that. And that is that considered as agronomic crops, many of these are really not ready for prime time. And insofar as diversity is kind of the point of these, we need to be concerned with having a lot of different options of this new kind of crop. And so um, there's a fairly long list of ways in which these crops are not quite ready for prime time. So the bottom line here is that as we look forward to agriculture and how it sort of functions in the basic life support uh, of our society, we need to deal with the fact that we need better versions of these new crops to add to our agriculture. And therein we run into a problem, and that is that the methods of crop breeding that we have relied on are just plain slow. So this is a very nice infographic the group of folks have pulled together that describe six different ways of um, genetically modifying or breeding crops. And the takeaway is that five of these are way slower and way more expensive than one of them. And the one down in the lower right-hand corner, termed genome editing, is a new technology that is interesting, uh, to say the least, as we think about this sort of outlook on agriculture of needing diversification, needing new crops, but needing better versions of the new crops than we have right now. So a major development, which I think almost everyone in this room is probably aware of, is the advent of this technique of so-called genome editing. The most well-known technology for that is something called CRISPR-Cas9. And um, it's similar in some ways to the so-called transgenesis technology that involves introducing foreign DNA. Um, you know, that's what people have meant by genetic engineering so far. But it has some important differences. First of all, it does not, uh, it's at least thought not to in introduce foreign DNA into um, the genetic makeup of, say, a crop. There's the ability to precisely target the manipulations, or again, it's thought to have that ability. And uh, there's good reason to think that it's just dramatically, orders of magnitude faster and cheaper than conventional breeding in, in many, many situations. And so um, it becomes, I think, of a lot of interest to ask, is this technology relevant to the advances in agriculture and the advances in the, the kind of um, genetic quality, if you will, of these new crops that we need to think about diversification of agriculture? And so that's really the, the question that, um, that I would like to engage us with. And it's not just a kind of academic question for me personally or for the University of Minnesota. I want to mention to you something called the Forever Green Initiative. This is a project that is working on this big sort of portfolio of, um, of crops that are um, either um, annual crops that are able to grow over the winter, where we generally, uh, in, in much of our agriculture, don't have anything growing. So there's an opportunity to diversify our, our agriculture there. Or there are perennial crops that um, avoid the sort of annual bother of replanting and all the kind of difficulties that go along with that. So we're working on this whole portfolio. This is, these are some photographs of some of them. And uh, th this project enrolls, uh, at this point, well over 90 folks here at the <coughs> University of Minnesota. The basic goal is to pr produce the plant materials that will allow this sort of change in our landscapes to go forward in a way that increases production, conservation, and resilience in our agriculture. And if you're curious about it, we have our own YouTube channel. This is what science has come to. The <laughs> scientific projects have to have YouTube channels, but actually there's a lot of interesting stuff there. So um, the Forever Green Initiative is really interested in this question of what are the technologies that we can use to go forward in this project because um, there's a lot of pretty darn interesting stuff that we're working on, but it is slow and expensive to improve it by conventional breeding. So a good example of that is uh, something that is part of the Forever Green portfolio called Field Pennycress. 
This has a lot of potential as a sort of new winter hardy oilseed crop. So some of its virtues are it can be grown after soybeans, or rather um, after corn is harvested and planted before soybeans. And um, it has lots of benefits in terms of covering up the soil in the winter, in providing habitat for our uh, very much sort of endangered pollinators. It has the ability to reduce the costs and um, chemical use in weed control. It produces um, an oil that can be made into things like green aviation fuel and various kinds of animal feed. There is reason to think that profitable markets can be found for these and there could be a considerable revenue for farmers and landowners, but it has a bunch of features that make it not ready for prime time agronomically. It may be invasive. It exists as a weed all around the world. We are very much presented uh, in the Forever Green Initiative with the question of should we use this to go forward with our breeding? The underlying genomic work has been accomplished, and some of it was reported in this, this paper. And so in Forever Green, we really want to know, will we have the ability to use these techniques going forward? So let's think about how that question could be approached, and let's think about the current situation. And let me tell you, or make a few observations about the situation right now. So. People all over the world are in laboratory settings applying genome editing to consider the rapid and inexpensive and precisely targeted genetic improvement of major field crops, wheat, corn, rice, and soybean. So uh, that's going on. They're also being applied experimentally to a much wider range of materials, sometimes by entrepreneurs and uh, nonprofit institutions. So there is this kind of ferment of um, applications of this technology that's getting started. There is, I think it's fair to say, no consensus on how there sh this should be governed. Uh, as we speak, the U.S. federal government is reviewing its whole regulatory approach to genetically engineered organisms. And this, uh, so this is an effort to come up with a regulatory framework that would be better than what we have. That sort of implies that it's possible with something as dynamic and unexplored as these technologies to actually define a regulatory framework in advance that has a snowball's chance of working. There is also uh, a lot of call by people like me who are scientists kind of in the front lines of this to s who are saying, well, we need dialogue with the public. And I think dialogue with the public is a great idea. But I would suggest that it's not proactive enough, and it's not fast enough, and it's not clear that it would be particularly fruitful given how incredibly polarized all discussions of genetic, these kinds of genetic technologies around agriculture have been. And furthermore, uh, some observers, including my colleague and co-author on this talk, Jennifer Kuzma of North Carolina State University, who prepared this figure in a recent Nature publication, in which she referred to a powder keg of tensions that are rapidly mounting around these technologies. And at this point, there really is a vacuum, I think it's fair to say, in the U.S. and to an extent global regulation of these new technologies. And so this is why the powder keg tension is mounting. The world of Folks who have concerns about these technologies views the fact that essentially unregulated, ungoverned uh, release of these crops into production is, is happening at an increasing rate, the lack of consensus around governance. And so um, our concern is that we have to, with some urgency, figure out how to go forward in this situation. And so the premises that I, I, I kind of stand behind are, one, I'm certainly convinced that society needs new crops to diversify agriculture. I'm certainly convinced that society needs p protection against the potential harmful effects of those crops. And I'm very convinced that we don't want that powder keg to explode. We do not want to replicate the situation 
uh, the, the tension and polarization and disputes that uh, at this point are you know, extremely intense around first generation GMOs. I think there's a major interest in not replicating that. And so what we propose is a modest experiment. This is um, uh, what we propose is literally an experiment in how to govern these new technologies as they're applied to agriculture. And I want to emphasize this is meant as an experiment. I want to kind of identify this whole idea as um, what people call social entrepreneurship. And what's meant by social entrepreneurship is an effort to use sort of private sector or market type forces to uh, solve problems where uh, there's a real public good uh, that's kind of at stake and it's not clear how to, how to get that public good to society. So this is what people mean by social entrepreneurship and what we're proposing I, I think can be described as a little bit of social entrepreneurship in the form of this governance experiment. What are the goals? One, explore the potential of genome editing for sustainable agriculture. And here I want to make want to be clear that this is not intended to be undertaken um, you know, on the premise that we think that society should adopt these technologies. Uh, my co-authors and I are, uh, I think it's fair to say, very impressed with the potential of these technologies. That's not the same as saying that they should be applied in some sort of ungoverned or unconditional way. So we're interested in exploring. We're interested in finding out what is the potential of these technologies. We're interested in doing something that we think is an essential um, uh, sort of uh, part of that, and that is exploring ways to make broad-based assessments of the resulting crops. In other words, to evaluate the resulting crops in terms of their social and environmental and economic impacts and to address questions like how do they um, address um, equity and justice in our food and agricultural systems. These are the kinds of questions that are the most profound concerns of the opponents of the current GMOs. And so when we say broad-based assessment, we mean assessing what, how well would these genetically modified crops for diversity for diversification actually fair. We also are very much interested in diffusing the powder keg because we think it is vital that society do this exploration, do this um, broad-based assessment, and essentially do those in a, in, a, in a closely linked way. Right now, I think it's fair to say that the whole idea of doing this is kind of a third rail, meaning that uh, it's kind of taboo even talk about it very much, particularly in the sustainable agriculture community. So how could this possibly go forward? What we would like to propose is, as our little bit of social entrepreneurship, is uh, an experiment in uh, what can be termed a private sustainability governance network. And before I sort of define that, let me tell you about an example that's a well-known and very successful example, the Forest Stewardship Council. Uh, what the Forest Stewardship Council does, it's essentially a consortium of various forest product industry groups and various environmental nonprofit groups. And what they do is that they certify forest products with this certification that is the mark of responsible forestry, as they say. And forests that are managed with the practices that are are seen as responsible, actually cover something like 300 million acres globally. So it's been quite a successful thing. And so this is an example of um, a private sustainability governance network. And, and my colleague Tim Smith, who's a co-author on this paper, is an expert in how these things work. So uh, the key features of what we're proposing are a network that would accomplish the following thing. One, promote that broad exploration that I was talking about. Two, set and enforce legitimate crop sustainability standards. In other words, just like the Forest um, Governance Network establishes this certification that says, okay, if you want our seal on your forest product, then you have to do certain things. There are certain criteria that have to be met. So 
this, that's what I mean by a sustainability standard. And uh, the, the basic dynamic by which this would work is that we think there's a potential to create a, an, an alignment of interests of three powerful groups that we think could come together to make this happen. What are these groups? Group one, crop breeding entrepreneurs. These are folks who have lots of ideas about how to produce new crops that would both find profitable markets and would bring that ecological and economic diversity into our agriculture. They, generally speaking, are limited by capital, financial capital. The second group are sustainability-minded investors. These are, um, these are folks that are sometimes known as long-term investors. They're sometimes known as patient, uh, providers of so-called patient capital, if you've heard those terms. These are folks that are, uh, to some degree, interested in return on investment, but they're also substantially motivated by wanting to make a difference on some sort of social and environmental goal. And there's an increasingly large pool of this capital out there in the world. And then the third uh, leg of the table are sustainable agriculture and development groups. These folks want influence. They're very frustrated about the fact that the whole project of diversifying agriculture is going really slowly. And so they want to have influence around diversification and the environmental and social concerns that they care about. So our network could align those interests. How might that work? First of all, a feature, a key, sort of the essential feature of the network would be creating what can be thought of an internal market that involves what people call an intermediary function. And this is a two-sided market that enables the patient capitalists to find good investments in terms of new crops um, that uh, could potentially become viable, could be ready for prime time, as it were, via genome editing. And then the other side of the market is that the, um, the entrepreneurs who are developing these can find folks to give them the seed capital that they need to advance their projects. So there's that internal two-sided market. That's a key feature. What that allows is certain of these crops can go forward in a process of uh, developing the crops and assessing them. And this would be done, uh, you know, presumably in sort of a confidential business information way. In other words, the, the intellectual property would, could be preserved in that process by various mechanisms. The result is that the crops that are promising get more capital. And so there's a, you know, a kind of incremental process of, of developing and assessing this is known, this, this whole idea has been developed around um, nanotechnology development, by the way, and it's known in that context as real-time technology assessment. So we're not making this up. And uh, the idea then is that the promising crops get more capital from the, the patient capitalists, and eventually crops are ready for actual commercialization, and at that point they would receive some sort of um, sustainability certification that would allow them to access markets and promotion. And the key feedback in this is that if that initial broad-based assessment process does not pass a certain uh, sniff test, which the patient investors are the base, uh, and, the, um, and also the, the sustainable agriculture groups, they're the ones that kind of get to say, okay, what do you have to, um, what do you have to, um, uh, you know, show us about this new crop in order to pass the test, in order to be eligible for more capital? And I would argue that the patient capitalists, they have a lot of money. They want that, they, they're impact investors, they want to see actual impact on the things they care about. The sustainable agriculture groups just want their whole program to advance. And by the way, they're not some sort of fringe group. There's strong consensus that diversification is a key part of agricultural development going forward. We argue that those two groups have a major incentive to work something out and to make this um, process go forward. The entrepreneurs, their projects aren't going to go anywhere unless they get capital. They have an incentive to work things out too. So uh, just to give you a, a sort of infographic look at the, 
the, what that broad-based assessment would look like. Something along these lines, um, people call this sort of process something like multi-stakeholder foresight analysis. The basic point is that we're looking at a lot of different aspects of the introduction of a new crop into agriculture, uh, including its genetically modified nature, but including lots of other attributes. And we are involving a wide range of folks in essen essentially a deliberative process that attempts to uh, decide if it would be a good thing to go forward in developing this. So that's what that broad-based assessment process would look like. And uh, we in the Forever Green Initiative, uh, you know, as I said, we have a major interest in this question. And so we're piloting a broad-based assessment of that Pennycress crop that I mentioned and starting to form an entrepreneur group and shopping this network idea around. This is field Pennycress, um, that, that winter hardy oil seed I mentioned. And so just to close with a few thoughts. First of all, again, to emphasize that we're not suggesting that this is a process that should be used to govern these technologies, uh, you know, for the foreseeable indefinite future. We recognize that it's going to be expensive, cumbersome, clunky, may simply result in gridlock. We want to emphasize this is an experiment. And we think that this sort of experimental approach to figuring out how to govern these technologies is the best way to go forward given the polarization and tension. And so indeed, the network may be a flop. But let's consider the alternatives. Let's consider the risks of inaction. And these are just a couple of images that have been uh, created by artists who are essentially commenting on the potential for if we're really not going to regulate things like CRISPR and the sort of synthetic biology that has involved, was involved in the creation of these little items, which are uh, known as um, semi-living worry dolls, and they contain tissue culture flesh, and um, possibly they will eat your worries and take them away for you, but that's, that's not clear yet. Um, the point is, there's a potential for a very chaotic situation, and we feel that that's not in society's interest in any way. And I'll, I'll close by circling back to agriculture and pointing out that if we really think about the need for an agriculture that, um, first of all, provides equity and justice and food security and food sovereignty to the world's population and meets their material needs and does so in the face of a gl global change and climate change, I submit to you that we may have to get creative pretty soon. And, and we may have to figure out entirely new kinds of agriculture, such as this. This is, a aqua, this is a large scale rain garden, essentially, in China that is collecting stormwater runoff, that is cleaning that water up with, believe it or not, these are canna lilies that you might grow in your garden. They have large edible tubers, who knew? And so the canna lilies are cleaning this water up microbiologically, and they're pulling excess nutrients out of it. They're creating excellent condition for fish aquaponics. So this is a system that, A, stores stormwater, provides, avoids things like urban flooding, and produces significant yields of both protein and carbohydrate foods. So that's pretty interesting, right? But, you know, canna lilies, there haven't been major crop breeding programs for canna lilies. And undoubtedly, if we tried to scale this up, we would find there were a lot of problems with canna lilies. So this is the sort of thing that, you know, you really have to ask yourself, could the genome editing te technologies really advance us getting creative in agriculture, doing the things we're going to have to do to meet food and energy water needs as we go forward into the future, and do it in a way that, uh, you know, is acceptable in terms of uh, democracy, food sovereignty, food justice, food security, those kinds of things. So with that, I will we'll close and, and very much welcome your thoughts and comments. Okay, as is the uh, tradition, please wait for the microphone. Yeah. Could you show us the slide that you had? 
Well, this gets to the, you know, the long-standing point that uh, we should be regulating the products of plant breeding. That um, there is, uh, a, we need to be focused on the actual impacts of these new crops that we produce. And, uh, you know, so th it's been a long-standing observation that we don't do that for most crops. And genetically modified crops are asked to meet certain conditions that other crops aren't. And this is kind of really what we're getting at. So if you think about a new crop like pennycress, what you really would want to do is to think about, okay, suppose we were to introduce 10 million acres of pennycress into the agriculture of the Midwest. That could have a lot of effects. Pennycress is not good for certain soil fungi that are extremely important to soil health. It could be a host for a whole wide range of pests. It could have impacts on, um, you know, a number of other sort of environmental things. And so what we're really talking about in this process is let's evaluate pennycress. And then let's consider, do we think pennycress is a pretty attractive crop? but it's got some flaws, in which case we'll think about fixing some of those with one kind of breeding or another. Um, do we think that new technologies are not necessary, in which case the whole matter is moot? Or do we think that pennycress is not something that we want to have around in our Midwest landscape, in which case it's also moot as to how we would develop this? That's what, I'm, that's what we're getting at. Uh, yes. So interesting talk, Nick. So I thanks, Larry. I actually I want to echo kind of that last point you made, which I think is a very good one. That <coughs> you know it always seems crazy to me that there's more focus on the method rather than the outcome. And you know, like with chemicals, we've learned how you know there's sucrose and there's sarin gas, and we kind of regulate them differently. They're both chemicals, but <coughs> you know, they're not the same. And, <coughs> you know, I think it's the same way, you know, whether it's agriculture or I see that with, you know, I genetically engineer bacteria and I have to go through the same things. And people don't, they evaluate more the method as opposed to, I mean, if we're, you know, cloning some gene for a totally innocuous protein and that can be demonstrated, that's very different than if we're cloning the gene for botulism toxin. You know, maybe the latter should be not allowed, right? So I think the, somehow we need to get the emphasis more onto the impacts and the actual, you know, outcome rather than the method. Because probably the method is a lot less harmful than, than the potential outcome. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just respond quickly that, that I, I do agree with that. I also acknowledge that there are folks who have concerns about the method. Fair. And, you know, we're not suggesting those should be, you know, swept under the carpet. But clearly in the case of these new crops, the, the impact of the crop is a major question. Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be on the table. Katie. How much money do you think you'll need to pilot the network and see if this works? Did you bring your checkbook? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I did. <laughs> <laughs> You're not saying. Um, we think that uh, the piloting could go forward for you know reasonable amounts of money. You know we're trying to get grants to do this of a few hundred thousand dollars for Pennycrest. But, you know, again, it's the first time you try it out. You know, prototyping is all, always expensive. But I, I think it's, you know, from the point of view of sort of venture capital, to, you know, to take an initial look at something that could have the enormous impact of a winter-hardy oilseed crop that could add a third crop to our corn and soybean agriculture, that's a huge thing. So, you know, $300,000 to do this initial assessment, you know, that's... That's probably not a crazy price tag. Um, well, I think 
the way that this would have to go forward is that there would be an initial vetting and questions would be identified and there would need to be then marshalling of some knowledge to try to answer those questions. So I think it would be somewhat iterative, but uh, I, I think it's you know a process that could go forward over a couple of years and come to a decision as to is this really something we want to scale up on and and you know that some investor would like you know would would have good reason to put significant money into the R and D. Thank you very much for a, a really great talk. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, I, I wanted to ask if you could speak a little bit more specifically about some of the benefits that you're assessing and on what time scales you're able to assess those. Um, when I see this talk, I think a lot about water impacts, uh, energy use impacts, but I wonder for things that have a longer time horizon like health impacts, um, to what degree are you able to capture those in the um, that coupled um, assessment and mm -hmm. development phase? Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's a good question. So. Um, an, an, an example of the sort of assessment might be that in um, smallholder agriculture all around the world, there's a great deal of interest in something that's called conservation agriculture. And conservation agriculture is essentially this project of uh, adding things that are, um, that essentially regenerate the soil. Uh, and and in there's a lot of smallholder agriculture in the world where there is this sort of process of soil degradation that's very powerful, and that uh, <coughs> drives the sort of what's called a poverty trap dynamic in which uh, people essentially cultivate this land that degrades and degrades and gets less productive, and they get more impoverished and have still less to invest in the land, and so um, if. So one of the big problems of conservation agriculture is lack of crops that are well adapted to uh, essentially add into those kinds of farms that would function like our penny cress to uh, provide a plant that can grow in this sort of fallow season. There's almost always some kind of fallow season. And so to provide something that can grow in that fallow season. And um, I bring this up because in terms of health impacts, um, the ability to improve uh, incomes and uh, the, the nutritional quality of what's produced in these farming systems has huge health impacts. And so uh, anything that we could introduce into these systems that you know, hypothetically could be made possible by this kind of genome engineering plant breeding could have really large health impacts. And we don't have to think very hard to us, you know, figure out if it's a positive or a negative. So, and, and, you know, in so, in other words, conservation agriculture is a well-studied system that involves diversification that is, you know, its adoption has been quite slow. And arguably lack of high quality um, um, crops, you know, plant materials to drive it forward has been a major limiting factor. So that's a situation where, you know, those are the kinds of uh, kind of benefits that, that I think we need to think about, particularly for global agriculture. And, um, you know, it, it, there's, so um, to the extent that people would directly eat the genome edited plants that would be added into these systems, there would then be questions of what would, might be the long-term impacts of consuming those foods. And admittedly, that's something that is not necessarily evident on short timescales. I think that's an, that's an, methods to assess those risks are not yet worked out. So I am kind of motivated by your, your challenge to leverage these technologies for the public good. Two of the issues that I've studied extensively in the last few years are climate change and, and, um, and biofuels production. Mm. So a couple of feasibility questions. On the, in the space of climate change, you've probably heard before of, of carbon capture and storage in electric power generation to capture coal emitted CO2 and injected under the ground. Mm -hmm. A variation on that, it, can you imagine the possibility of developing a voracious carbon sequestering crop and then essentially burying the biomass as a sequestration tool? 
I, I certainly can imagine the former, yeah. Uh, so we know that there are perennial grasses, say, that have um, norm allocate an enormous amount of their fixed carbon below ground. And uh, it, we also know that uh, there is genetic variation in those kinds of species for those sorts of root system attributes. So uh, there are undoubtedly biological limits on the voraciousness factor, but I'm sure that we could come up with something that was reasonably voracious, yes. Uh, I would have to take a pass on the burying of the biomass, uh, you know, in terms of whether that would really work out sort of geologically, if, sure. if that's what you mean, as opposed to long-term storage in agricultural soils. Right, right, okay. So second question, in the area of using, going into second generation biofuels with using um, lignocellulosic crops for, for biofuels production, mm -hmm. I understand the problem has been this hemicellulose matrix that is very difficult to penetrate to get the sugars out to make ethanol, for instance. And so uh, can you see the possibility of developing a crop that is not so protectant of that, of that sugar cover in order to make it more accessible, more readily accessible for ethanol production? Well, again, I'm not enough of a plant physiologist slash structural biologist person to really say. Undoubtedly, there would be trade-offs. Undoubtedly, there would be some impact on the biology and ecology of the plant if you were to change that fundamental feature of its architecture. But I think it would be premature to say it's not possible. I do want to say that there are uh, rapidly advancing technologies for getting beyond that barrier, by the way. But to your broader point, the ability to, if we think about what, it, what to my mind is a broader implication of what you said, if we think about this whole bioeconomy, as some folks call it, and the question of how that can be developed and, and, and sort of tailored, the ability to precisely modify uh, plant species so that they produce end products that are well tailored for particular markets and applications, that seems like an enormously valuable thing. And if that's sort of a generalization of what you were talking about, I, I think that's a very important um, potential advantage of these technologies. Hi, Karen. Nick. Thanks for your talk. Um, I have two questions for you. The first is related to um, the slide that you had where there's, the, you know, the kind of detailing these six different types of biotechnology. And I'm wondering if you think or see that these, uh, that the new technologies are making the other technologies obsolete and if there would potentially be um, a difference in consumer perception with the transition to newer technologies. And the second question I have is, um, you mentioned that the regulatory structure um, through government agencies is kind of being discussed right now. Do you think or foresee the outcome of that process as affecting um, your networks? Mm -hmm. Well, very good questions. So. You know, the, the basic situation, I think, Sharon, is that these four, these three and this one, you know, these are the sort of older technologies that are, are less precise and take a long time. And so they, they really contrast a lot with this one, which is basically first generation genetic engineering for crops, and then the new techniques. And the real question is whether the kind of yuck factor you know, that has been associated with these technologies is, and you know, which, about which there's tremendous debate and ambivalence, right, as you well know. The real question is whether that feeling is going to be transferred over to these technologies. And I would say that um, that's a dynamic that uh, is very complicated and depends on the social and political agendas of 
and views and, and sincerely held moral values of a really wide range of organizations, as you well know. And so the question of, um, you know, of how the views of people who eat food about these technologies get shaped and formed, that's, I think, a very open question, how that goes forward. And the attitudes of influential non NGO organizations and, you know, the sort of this, what they, you know, say in, in their policy positions about things like this, I think, can matter. And that's why bringing those groups into a private sustainability governance network to really work through these possibilities and come to a, come to a decision as to, uh, you know, how those kinds of stakeholders feel about these technologies, that's why we think that would be really valuable. As to the federal effort, uh, and there's a similar effort in the EU underway, it's, it's very unclear what's going to come out of that. And, um, but I think, it's, I think it's pretty unlikely that, uh, that those parties would put something in place that would block our little experiment. I, I, I will say that. So, yes. so I kind of a follow-up to that question. Um, so I'm thinking about the Pennycrest example you gave, and I'm thinking about the technologies as they're drawn here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's very possible that it could be that biologically, for whatever reason, the, the most eco-friendly genetic changes you can make in the system would involve transgenesis rather than genome engineering. So I guess my question is, has that ship sailed, or could this sort of network be also applied to sort of first-generation methods for transgenesis? Or are we 20 years too late? Has that sort of story already been told? Mm, yeah, that, that's an interesting thought. Uh, our best hope, Bob, is to try to walk back the polarization to some degree and establish, uh, you know, what we don't have right now, I think, uh, for the most part, and that is a community of people that are talk that span the you know the official sustainable agriculture groups and the official biotechnology and agriscience groups. Right now, you know, as you well know, we have a lot of polarization around the first generation stuff. I think it is possible to walk that back potentially by some sort of process that. You know, I, I think a lot of the opponents feel that there has to be some sort of broad-based assessment, and that should be uh, an influence on at least public investment in these, the applications of these technologies. I think that's, my opinion is that that's a, a vital interest. So if we could develop a process that could meet that interest, then potentially that could migrate to transgenesis, yeah. Other questions? Hi, Nick. I'm wondering. Into that. Okay. Um, you presented the labeling from an example of the food or forest stored forest stewardship. Mm -hmm. um, are you proposing something like that for the crops as well? And would you do that for the crop itself or for the end use product? I feel like that could get messy and have to, you know, have a long chain of labeling? Uh-huh. Uh, well, I, I think that, um, I think this process would be about the crops. And one could imagine, I mean, what the Forest um, Stewardship Council does is they certify, you know, as you probably know, they certify production. So, you know, certain sustainable forestry practices. and. You know, the, the I, I, I think that, uh, that that kind of certification of, you know, okay, so here we have a food product. It contains pennycress oil, and that pennycress oil meets, you know, was made from a pennycress and then was came from a cropping system that meets certain standards. You know, that would be kind of analogous, I think. And, and one could imagine that. But I, but I guess that wouldn't be the first. I think certifying the crops as, you know, 
worthy of consideration in any kind of sustainable form of agriculture. I think that would be the immediate goal. Other questions? <laughs> that was very dramatic. A very basic question. I was wondering if you were aware of other groups in Europe or in, um, in Asia who are trying those type of experiments. And if there are these groups, are you planning on interacting with them and exchanging yeah. experiences? Do you mean, so you mean a governance experiment, right? Not experimental use of the technologies um, per se. You mean the sort of governance experiment that we're talking about? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Well, no, uh, we're not. And um, if you know of any or any clues as to uh, the possible existence, we would love to know about that. All right, last question here. <laughs> how, many, how many crops are already GMO'd that we're consuming, not knowing that we're consuming them? Do you have any idea? Well, sure. I mean, the, the main first generation GMO crops are corn and soybean. And so there's also cotton. And uh, there are some edible uses of cotton and oil. Um, but you know, the, by far the largest flow of GMO crops into the global food system is in the form of corn and soybean. And there, there's not much beyond that. All right. Um, Kim, what's the title next week? <laughs> so join us next week for what's new on the climate change front. Um, with, oh, my goodness, with Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Uh, it's uh, who um, is uh, a leading evangelical climate scientist and will be here for <laughs> Frontiers. So it should be an interesting talk. Uh, thank you, Nick, um, to add to your collection. Oh, to thank you. Lovely Excellent. parting gift. Uh, thank you all. Please, please feel free to hang around and, and chat as you see fit. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you.